Well, good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of FinWeek Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Samantha Loring, and as per usual, my co-host Mark Ashton, the editor of FinWeek. Well, coming up on the show today, in South Africa, 50% of children drop out of school. That's before they reach matric. So FinWeek's cover story this week questions the compulsory education system. In our investment segment, uh, we'll be taking a look at the future and what that holds for our baby boomers here in South Africa. Plus, we'll discuss the changing la landscape of executive education. So, of course, an executive education focus today and education certainly in the spotlight on this show. And uh, if you have any comments for us, you can send any uh, questions or feedback through to moneymatters at abn360.com. Well, let's start off uh, by looking at the trade of the week uh, with Mark. And uh, Mark, we're looking at Sassel today. Uh, you know, it's above 400 rand, mm -hmm. so it's managed to, to cross above that mark. It's at exactly 412, 70 as it stands at uh, this minute. Um, so we've had a case of, you know, the, the oil price coming under considerable amount of pressure, certainly a lot of bearish reports around the output coming through from non-OPEC countries. But then you've got this weaker rand. Uh, so how do these two play into the Sassel story? Sure, so there's a couple of things to look at here. Obviously, the rand is a big one for sales so I think it works out about every 10 cents move over a year works out to about 300 million rand either for or against sales so rand slipped quite significantly in the last week or so it's good for them in the long run mm -hmm. psychologically sales sat underneath 400 rand for quite a long time it broke through for a while dropped back beneath and has been trading somewhere between 350 and 400 rand a share for the last probably three or four months reason I picked Sassol today, it's actually quite interesting. I was actually reading a report from Robert Cowan Investments and they were saying that back in 1983 you could buy a Sassol at 4 and 20 a share, 4 and 20, 4 and 30 a share. And today, this last dividend that they paid out was 17. 19, what, 1983. 1983. 1983. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and they've just paid out a dividend of 17 rand 20 a share. Mm -hmm. So what the, the point they were trying to illustrate there is that the, the petrol price has been increasing quite dramatically. It's one of the things that when you sit around at dinner table, everybody gripes about the petrol price. Their counter argument was, well, then buy Sassel. And uh, you know, it, it sounds almost like a bit slapstick and a bit funny mm -hmm. to consider, but Sassel has been very good at delivering dividends consistent capital growth. I think we'll eyes now turn to the US. This Louisiana deal is big for them. I mean, mm -hmm. essentially it's the size of their, ca their market cap. And what the concerns there are that has Sassel bitten off more than it can chew. And remember there's been issues around what happened in Iran, um, the gas liquids operations that they've been trying to roll out and get on, on, on stream. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying, you know, we're doing this really, really big deal in the US. Can we actually stomach it? Well, I mean, anecdotally, uh, institutional investors, big institutional investors here in South Africa, are sitting down with Sassel management right now and saying, we're starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable about the scale of investment and the kind of money that you're putting uh, into a, a space right now that there's no guarantees there. Sure, and, and I think if you look at if you if you take a step away from Cecil and you look at a lot of the resource companies, they're ha having to answer the same questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're running around trying to set up operations in both developed and emerging markets. And the shareholders are saying, but is this as smart as use of our capital at the moment? In Cecil's case, I believe it's a yes. I think Cecil had to transform itself from just being a South African business that did some cool things with GTL technology. But the, it had to go and reinvent itself as, a, as not just an oil company, but a technology player across the globe. Mm -hmm. Iran was an interesting thing, and, and I think that the, and China and, and th those operations looked interesting. I think the problem is that the operating environment that they were in there was very unstable. I think you don't want to be a South African business doing business with, with Iran right now. Mm -hmm. I think globally nobody wants to be seen as being painted into that corner. If you go and you look across at the um, US, you know th there's credibility to it. There. And, and I think if you look at Sassel relative to its international peers, it trades on a uh, earnings multiple single digits, where a lot of the other oil and gas, you know, the BPs, the shells, etc., sort of 10 to 12 times. PE, so that they're not being priced the same as their peers. You know, it's an interesting story because we're spending a lot of time also talking about, you know, obviously their, their global peers, um, and we're talking about Sassel in America, but it's also Sassel in Africa. I mean, if you were listening to uh, Christine Ramon at WEF Africa, she was talking about Mozambique specifically mm. being a major driver for them. And we know, of course, the gas fines there is, is why they, they're looking to get in there. But the energy story in Africa is one that Sassel is certainly positioning itself at the forefront of, or hoping to do that. Sure. And I think there's one thing Sassel does do very well. They, they stand out in South Africa, top quality technology, top quality people, 
they have real credibility. They really, they're, they're a global company headquartered in South Africa at the moment. I think the US thing is interesting, th sorry, the Africa thing is interesting because it gives people access to the continent. You know, if you look at what's happening in Nigeria at the moment, Nigeria, Ghana, a lot of those international producers, the Shells and the, the BPs, et cetera, are in fact re selling their assets back to local producers. The, you know, there's a lot of tension between the, the local entrepreneurs that are trying to come through and, and, and government operators. And they're saying, but we keep exporting all of our technology, all of our people, all of our dividends to these mm. international firms. And can we do it better? And I think that the advantage that SASOL has here is that it is it has credibility as a local institution. There's no guarantees, though, no, with any of these investments. I mean, what would you see if you had to look at SASOL right now? Because it certainly has been a company that has been around for a long time. And as you say, it's got that credibility and weight to it. Uh, but what would be the, the factors that would say, OK, there should be uh, you know a little bit of caution around investing in a company right now that, yes, we've had the run up from, from four rand. Mm -hmm. Um, but what could limit the growth on, on, from a shareholder's perspective? Well, I think, look, there are a couple of things that really have weighed on SAS over the last couple of years. They had a lot of anti-competitive issues, particularly in Europe. They had the, um, the, the, the environmental issues, which also weighed on the company. But mo the thing that worried people was they were constantly investing. They were trying to get all of this capacity online, and it just wasn't coming online as fast as people were expecting. And I think that that's the big issue now that they have with, this, the, with the US deal. One thing about Sasol is that it generates cash. It pays for its, its, its capex through its cash generation, mm -hmm. and it has always done that. It's a great business from that perspective. And I think that what you can find in Sasol is you've got something that fundamentally is sound. It's not borrowing. It's not trying to stretch itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're taking on big projects, but they're funding it off their own resources. Well, let's leave it at that. Thank you for that. Uh, that, of course, the trade of the week this week, Sasol, currently sitting at... Uh, Four and twelve. In fact, it's gone down seventy cents or so since we last uh, mentioned the price. It's time now to take a look at the baby boomers and the outlook for them here in South Africa. Well, South Africa has, of course, joined the global economy and more and more locals are beginning to contemplate retiring abroad. So Finweek this week uh, takes a look at some of the best places to retire if you are not planning to stick around here in South Africa. We, of course, not encouraging you to leave, but we certainly are looking at what options there are for you on the table. Joining us for this conversation, Jessica Hubbard, Finweek journalist, Mark Jurgens from Jurgens Finance. Um, and he, he, of course, is the CEO there and Ricky Williams, certified financial planner. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Yeah. Mark, so I'll just kick off with you in terms of this article. I mean, what motivated looking at this uh, specifically right now? And hopefully it's not all the kind of drama that we've had in the mining sector. No, I mean, I think that it's one of the, it's, it's an interesting discussion and it's not a mainstream discussion. I mean, I, I think the reality is we were just chatting a little bit off air that it's not, a, it's not an opportunity that's going to present itself to all South Africans. But what you are finding is that South Africans are joining the global economy. They spend, you know, there are those that are well to do, can afford to spend six months in South Africa, six months somewhere else. Mm -hmm. they, the assets are not just based around South Africa. And I mean, we've just seen it this week. Rand has really weakened significantly. It, it plays havoc with your local investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to diversify your assets and be able to take them offshore. I, I remember listening to Michael Yodan speaking middle of last year at one of the investment conferences, and his comment there was, the biggest decision South Africans are going to have to make over the next decade is where do they put their money? Mm -hmm. Because yes, it's been fantastic. 1994 to 2000, no, 20, 2008, you've been able to absolutely coin it. Our markets have flown, our property's done well. We've really had it the best of all worlds up until the 2008 financial crisis. We're still doing all right relative to a lot of peers, but unfortunately there's this issue of um, How much security. further can yeah. the market What, what more can we do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that the issue is that there may be better opportunities somewhere else. And you have to be serious. If, if, if the UK, for instance, provides you with a better quality of living, or you want to follow Sassel into Louisiana, I mean, you, there, there are opportunities mm. there, and we can do it. I think that Forex has always been a big issue for us. That seems to have now, that's largely fallen away. Now we've got the opportunity to be in that market. What do we do about it? Some would argue it perhaps hasn't really fallen away if you look at the round where it's going right now in terms of your ability to live offshore. Sure, uh, uh, and that's why I think uh, I think when I refer to forex, uh, you talk yeah. about your, your allowance, what you can yes, take overseas. Yeah. So I think that, that the, the rules are changing, letting you take more and more assets overseas. Mm -hmm. You now have to take advantage of it and learn how to diversify. Yeah. So uh, Mark, I'll start off with you. Um, let's just talk about the uh, let's talk about the environment right now and what you're finding from your clients who are retiring. I mean, are they wanting to go uh, offshore? Are you finding that uh, with people saying, "Listen, this is an option for us." How I plan for that? I think there are. I think um, 
Um, as Mark said, with the uh, perhaps instability and perhaps political instability that we've experienced here over the last year or so as well, perhaps more people are looking at retiring out of our borders, beyond our borders, than, than we've perhaps seen before. I think I'll agree with you, Mark, it's only a very small percentage of people that can afford to retire overseas. The RAD is pretty weak. Um, and I think they're limited countries one can look at uh, while moving overseas. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine bought a one-bedroom apartment in the UK for the same price as you could buy, live, you could, for the same money, you could live in a luxury apartment in Santon. So you have to choose areas very carefully, but certainly from an investment point of view to diversify and uh, get more access to international equity markets is very important at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll probably become a bigger trend going forward. I think we're going to see more of it going over yeah. the next 10 years. How much of it is financial planning though? I mean, you know, we, we know that we cannot buy shares overseas, great, that you know, I can buy General Electric, you, most of us can find our stockbrokers and we've got that, but that's not really diversifying assets, that's simply saying I, I'm clicking a button and I've got that's a bit right. of access to it. Mm -hmm. What's the role of the financial planner then in looking at how do I split my assets up in getting overseas? Mm. Mark, I think realistically now, you know, people want to look at at least putting 50% of their assets offshore. That's my advice to a lot of people. Just the rand appreciation by itself makes money for you. Our equity markets have run hard, as you've said before, the JSE. I think there's more value offshore at this stage. So it's simply from an investment point of view, it makes sense to have a larger portion of your assets offshore than it has made over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Besides that, investing in property, investing in other assets besides equities is what a lot of people are doing, simply for to be landlords, to let their properties out, perhaps with a view to moving there themselves in, in, at retirement stage. So your property's been paid off by letting it out to somebody. Um, which saves huge money as far as that's concerned. I think what a lot of South Africans will still do is, as you said, maybe go overseas for six or eight months and maybe come back for a couple of months. You've heard people emigrating and they want to move over for their kids. Mm. And uh, a couple of years later, their kids want to move back to South Africa. So we've heard those stories, but, um, but it's not only investing. I think it's property and it's looking at investments from A to Z. Ricky, and, you know, from your side as a financial planner, do you see that 50% is the right allocation? Because that is a, quite a large chunk of assets. Uh, to be able to move into an offshore exposure? I think um, uh, picking up on Mark's question, um, I think it, uh, is the, the role of the financial plan is absolutely integral. Mm -hmm. And the first hard job is to get people, to convince people really is the right word, to put the appropriate amount of money offshore. The percentage changes. There is a thing that we work with called the efficient frontier, mm -hmm. which uh, will indicate um, a global asset allocation spread and that will change as fundamentals change on, a, on an ongoing basis. 50% I think is um, not to disagree with Mark, I think it's minimum right now. So the first hard job as I, as I said is to firstly convince people to do that mm -hmm. and secondly once the money gets there as Mark has said uh, there is so much choice over there. Um, the huge fear that South Africans have is that we so far away from certainly developed uh, destinations and um, you know traditionally we uh, in, in, uh, in um, global investment terms we actually since 97 it's only been legal so we are miners we minor leaguers so there's a long way to go in terms of learning processes people are nervous and the financial planners job is to lead the client in the right direction with the ultimate objective of satisfying that family's personal goals. And Ricky, if one was to start planning to retire overseas, how far ahead should you be planning and allocating assets to make that move as smooth as possible? Jessica, you know that those kinds of th decisions um, traditionally come much later in life. When people are starting to think about retirement, they start considering where they're going to retire. Um, when they're going to retire starts becoming uh, not a wishful dream but mm -hmm. uh, a reality and um, I, I would say if when you're 50 you should be sitting down with your financial plan and seriously talking about setting retirement goals mm -hmm. trying to crystallize the answers to the questions that uh, that, uh, that, that I've just raised mm -hmm. uh, and certainly put plans firm plans in place and the, the financial planner can guide you with the right asset allocation, the right product choices, local and offshore, mm. is to be able to satisfy and, and meet those goals. And are you seeing clients taking, uh, sort of planning far enough in advance and taking the planning fa phases Very seriously so. enough? 
very much so. When it comes to Mark, and I suppose it's, they're, they're the lucky clients who do have financial planners yes. sitting down with them and, and showing them you know, the value of doing that. Um, when it comes to longevity, that's also an issue. Is people are living longer sure. and they're having to support themselves in retirement for longer. How does that affect the uh, retirement planning phase before retirement starts? Well, it's a very, very interesting question and very important question because with medical technology, people are living almost three years longer than they used to, not only in South Africa. You heard the story about the Queen having to send a couple of years ago, sent 15 cards, I think it was per annum, to people who turned 100 years of age. I think the forecast is that by the year 2050, there are going to be over 60,000 people living in the UK that are going to be over 100 years of age. Sure. So big concern for all the first world countries. And uh, besides people immigrating, it's a big concern for people here in South Africa who plan to retire here because a very high percentage of people outlive their money. So what does that mean then from a planning perspective right now if you're not in retirement yet? It simply means save more money and start investing and put more money aside for retirement now. What I can tell you from experience is that doing presentations and speaking to anybody under the age of 45 is a very boring subject. <laughs> uh, people tend to say, I think I've got better things to discuss mm -hmm. at this stage. You know, I've got, uh, I'll worry about that when I'm in my 50s. But as Ricky said earlier on, uh, you should have crystallized your plans by 50, but saving starts as soon as you get your first job mm -hmm. and allocating X amount of money for the longer term and leaving it for the longer term. Ricky, you touched on something, uh, one of the discussions, obviously, if you're looking at offshore property, for instance, I mean, one of my concerns, I was just rolling it over in my head now, is who actually looks after that asset. I mean, it, it's easy for me to buy a 300 rand a month Marriott offshore property fund um, and, and say that I've got offshore property exposure, but in reality, that's not. I mean, that's not an. You know, that's not really diversifying assets. That's just a little bit of. It's a little bit of shuffling of, of a portfolio. How do you go and say I, I want assets overseas, but how do I actually look after them in such a way that you know I, I actually keep tabs on what are happening to these assets that are over there? It's a fantastic question, Mark. Um, I think it's one of the things that puts people off as well is not understanding how solid and professional the um, the, the 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 buy to let market is there. Mm -hmm. So statistics in London, um, as recently as two, two or so years ago, are that 42% of um, residential property is uh, occupied by renters. Yes. Now that is a massive, massive percentage. So you, you can appreciate that over the years, highly professional structures have uh, developed around that rental market. And both Mark and I have access to um, professional managers there mm -hmm. who can not only source the right type of property for you, they will tenant the property, they will keep you um, informed of the, the rental stream, they will take care of the, the management of that, uh, that, that property and the, the maintenance and, and, and upkeep, and even go as far as to uh, comply with South African tax documentation mm -hmm. that you might require. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, very professional services, but they come at a Quite it's a price. perhaps less of a minefield than renting here with our issues. What about, um, you know, what about uh, if you are, because there are going to be 9 million South Africans retiring in the next 25 years. Um, what if your client is looking and saying, okay, yes, I've lived in South Africa for the majority of my life. Perhaps there's somewhere where I could go and try out in my retirement years and look at an option to live offshore. I mean, what are you getting a sense from in terms of where the best places are to retire um, if you are looking to leave South Africa's uh, shores? <laughs> Well, the very well healed, and perhaps uh, less than 1% of people are looking, I think, at Europe. It's a very small percentage anyway. As I said, a very large percentage of people just simply worry about having sufficient funds to live out their retirement. Uh, but I think Europe is always going to be a number one destination for a lot of South Africans. You've heard of people who have uh, properties in France or Italy and plan to go and spend the summer there. Well, it's cold here in Africa, which is what people are doing now, and they come back here and, and uh, September, October, when it gets a little warmer. I think that's a common thing that a lot of people are doing already. So step away from the, the, the super wealthy in South Africa. Is this something that uh, m middle income South Africans can consider? Because just looking at some of the options, I mean, international living's top retirement countries, Ecuador stands out there because of the cost of living and of course the climate. Mm. I think Ecuador is a place a lot of people look at. I think Mauritius is another destination people have looked at. I believe a lot of UK residents move to Kenya. They like the climate there. I believe there are certain uh, countries in South America that are appealing as well. Uh, Panama, perhaps, I believe, is another one. So, you know, some of the countries we would never really have thought of, but, uh, but, but those, 
I think those countries that are third worldish, but they've got good medical facilities and they perhaps got have good climates and there's a bit of government stability are the areas that people would look at. You touched on some there, the medical cost, and I think that, that that to me would probably be one of my biggest concerns when you get old, can you afford, where's the, you know, the, the cost of actually Absolutely. being able to retire medically. Very much Because, so. you know, in South Africa, we've got a de decent healthcare system, private healthcare system, yeah. but what's it like, is, is it a factor to be considered when yeah. you're going overseas? I think very important, mm -hmm. Mark, yes, yeah. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's high on the agenda on people when they do look at uh, relocating to any other country. And are you ser seeing certain countries that have marketed themselves as being pensioner friendly or trying to mm. market certain benefits to encourage immigration? I think it's good for any country to have people come in with money. You now they're contributing towards the, uh, mm. the tax regime of that particular country. They are uh, they're consuming products. Mm. Um, so I haven't seen too much of it at this stage and, I'm, and I can actually say from my personal point of view, I find that more people are just investing more overseas, leaving their options open mm -hmm. and perhaps mm -hmm. going to decide in a few years' time mm -hmm. what is the best option because this is a fairly new scenario we're finding for South Africans moving offshore and I think over the next five years time will tell as to which des destinations actually prove to be the most fruitful mm -hmm. from that point of view. Do you think this is going to be a trend that we see in South Africa, more and more South Africans choosing to retire uh, offshore? Ricky? Bit of a sensitive question from a, from a political perspective because I think a lot depends on that. Mm -hmm. So people are feeling uneasy and as soon as people feel uneasy their attention turns um, to places where it might ordinarily not have. So I think that um, people are thinking about it more. Uh, perhaps not seriously yet. Your clients? Yes. Mm -hmm. And both of Mark and I will have the experience that over the years people's actions start following their thinking. So as people's thinking becomes more and more serious and should the political tensions not ease themselves in this country, then people will start becoming infinitely more serious and, and even you can expect that it might even become urgent at a stage. That well, will be that will be terribly sad, but um, mm -hmm. you know it's it's not out of the question. Yeah, it could be a reality. Thank you for joining us today, and of course sure. looking at the issues around planning for retirement. Of course, Mark Jurgen, CEO of Jurgen's Finance, and Ricky Williams, certified financial planner. It's time for a quick ad break. When we come back, we're taking a look at Finweek's cover story this week, that on compulsory education and whether it's appropriate in South Africa. Do stay tuned. <laughs> Well, since 1994, the South African government has been harping on about an inclusive approach to education. Despite record levels of investment in the education system, we still rank as one of the world uh, worst in the world. Now, in its cover story this week, Finweek asked the question whether compulsory education is actually hindering a smarter economy in South Africa. Joining us to look at this further, Jessica Hubbard, Finweek journalist, Kume Ramuli for the DA Gauteng Education spokesperson. And then Mark, of course, uh, is still with us. And Mark, you wrote the story this week. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it uh, is uh, appropriate to kick off with you. Um, what inspired this specific story? Okay, so basically what happened, they actually came from my got two kids, one's age 10, one's 16, they're both in decent government schools, um, but my 10 year old is one of the ones, is a child that we adopted, and so he's come with some learning disabilities along the way, and we started working through, and, and he's had, he, he tends to go through quite a predictable p pattern each year, which he starts the year off poorly and then kind of catches up with everybody else. This year he hasn't started off particularly well at all, and we started going through his workbooks, and I noticed that the one workbook the teacher hasn't looked at in a month, in a, in a term and a half. Now this is a decent government school, and teacher hasn't looked at this book in a term and a half. And again, I stick my hand up, parents should also have been checking it as well, but this this, this kind of brings it to a head. And, and I kind of started thinking about the situation, you, you, you have a disengaged parent, which in this case is me, you have a disengaged child, because the child's not usually keen on doing the work that's in front of them, mm -hmm. and you have a disengaged teacher. So tell me, what do you get? You get a disengaged learning environment. 
And, and we, I kind of started doing some reading about this whole th concept of compulsory education. Should one be forced to go to school? A and the Free Market Foundation's actually written some quite interesting research around the fact that if you actually stop making it compulsory for people to go to school, um, there's a tax reason. There, there's some tax reasons in terms of return on investment for your taxes, where people that don't want to be at school can walk out the door, and and then there's also just a. It's so you're a, not paying for those people who yeah. are actually hindering the system. Correct. You're not paying. You're not trying to subsidise it. Now I, I get the whole thing about education being important. I don't for a moment argue mm -hmm. that. But you know, I started chatting to some of the teachers around this, and they say one of their biggest issues is, and irrespective of whether it's a rural school or a decent government school, they cannot maintain any level of discipline because it's very easy um, if the parents don't like your decision. So the one teacher relates to me a story about how they give the child detention on a Thursday or Friday and the very next day a lawyer's letter arrives to say why you can't send your, this child to detention. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly you're fighting the system again. Um, you, you, the rural schools don't have the resources to do it. They try, they really do try. But you, you ultimately have this environment where you're trying to force people into this little box, try to do as much as possible to try and get as many people through the system. And the reality is, despite all the hundreds of billions of rands that we've pumped into education since 1994, reality is that's not turning into a workforce. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's a if you had a better engaged schooling environment, mm -hmm. and you know, like the, to the teacher's point, if he doesn't like this person, tell him there's a door. And the yeah, I mean, it's 